Ron Wolfson, it makes me just happy to see you and to share you with so many people that make me happy to see that they're part of this conversation. Many of you are tuning in because you already know Ron, and Ron has been already doing a lot of teaching in Orange County. He did significant work with Bat Yam. He has spoken at CBI. He's done work with our Community Scholar Program. Ron, who lives with his wife Susie in Los Angeles and teaches at American Jewish University Jewish Education, has spent the last seven months with Susie at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. They went for their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> but in addition, they went because Susie needed a kidney and they'd been waiting for this opportunity. And Ron gave the ultimate anniversary gift, <laughs> enabling both of them to have a promise of many more years, God willing, in celebration uh -huh. together. But it, it, weeks and months have now turned into seven months. And this is, again, the benefit of Zoom where we can, you know, share time as if you were in LA, but at a distance. So I'm only going to say a few more words, but just to show off some of the books that I grabbed from my bookshelf that Ron has written. The most important for us in this moment is this book by Ron, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven, in that anybody who participates this year in a small group gets a free copy from Barbara Baim honoring her husband, Joe, our beloved Joe Baim. And I've read the book, loved the book, which is why I've recommended that we as a community engage in conversations. And we put together a nice little booklet of conversations for our small groups. And you will, here's our little booklet, and you will have received just within the last hour a lovely video on small groups with our chair, Batya Swed, and a number of testimonials. Many of you have done this already, but if you haven't, this will be the year to spend more time with Ron Wolfson and with your friends. Here's just a few of Ron's journeys into this moment. This book is aged. It's the Passover Seder that came out in 1988, the year that I came to Congregation B'nai Israel. Wow. Done for the Jewish Men's Club. He also did one on the Sabbath Seder. And that was some of the earlier writings. And then he created, in the intervening years, something called Synagogue 2000 and then Synagogue 3000, in which he and a close friend of his, Rabbi Larry Hoffman, um, became, one second, became um, experts on synagogue life and guiding synagogues as to best practices. And that work over a number of years led to a book called The Spirituality of Welcoming. And I will add our own Saddleback Church and our mutual friend, Pastor Rick Warren, became an influence on models of welcoming. And that led Ron to write this book called Relational Judaism, which I'm very fond of, using the power of relationships to transform the Jewish community. And that'll be a key part of our focus, but all the more in this COVID time, how synagogues are changing and what are the lessons that determine the Jewish American future. And another sweet book, The Best Boy in the United States of America. And there's a young Ron growing up in Omaha, Nebraska. That's Purim, 1958. <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to start focusing on you, Ron, as the person who speaks. But again, thank you for making this time to join us and to... Um, Connect us with the larger Jewish community, because that's your work. Talk a little bit about Synagogue 2000. When did that begin, and how did that, you know, what did you learn about American synagogues? 
So thank you, Rabbi Spitz. I, your congregants, I hope they know <laughs> that in my book, you are the best rabbi in the United States of America. <laughs> and I mean that. I know a lot of rabbis, and there is nobody more innovative, more knowledgeable, more menschlich than Rabbi Eli Spitz. I adore you. And that's the point. It's all about relationships. And I cherish my relationship with you, Rabbi Spitz. That's Thank for sure. you. Thank you. Uh, so Larry Hoffman and I met in 1994, and we began the project in 1995 because we both shared a belief that synagogues were in need of uh, what we call transformation. And uh, one of the very first things we did uh, was put out a, a press release about our vision and the kind of work we wanted to do. And this rabbi in Orange County named Ellie Spitz called me up at the American Jewish University and said, Ron, if you're really interested in this topic, you have to come down to Orange County and see two things. You have to see the Crystal Cathedral and you have to meet Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren at Saddleback Church. And Rabbi Spitz, you were the person who motivated me to come down there with Larry Hoffman, and it blew us away. Uh, it was fundamental to our thinking about how we could take the lessons of the megachurch and apply them to our synagogue life. Uh, I'm just going to pause one second because I know Marianne Malkoff is on, and my yeah. own connection to those institutions is through Marianne and Mel Malkoff, so I just want to Shout That's out right. of gratitude to them. That's right. The Malkoffs were beloved, beloved consultants to Rick Warren early in the Saddleback story. But the bottom line, Rabbi Spitz, is when there were 5,000 people coming to a church service six times a weekend. Think of that. It's like Kol Nidre six times a weekend. <laughs> I wanted to know what was going on. And one of his secrets in building his community was in fact small groups. So from since 1995, I've been fascinated by how the church world uses small groups to connect people to each other in meaningful ways. And of all the congregations I know and visited, and there are hundreds of them all over the world, your congregation is the one who has pioneered using small groups to connect each other, to connect friends, to connect them to you and to Jewish life, which in my mind are the three tiers we discovered in Synagogue 2000 and Synagogue 3000. How do we use the vehicle of the congregation to engage Jews with Judaism, which we do a pretty good job with and at? Uh, how do we deepen connection to the clergy and the staff and the lay leadership of the congregation? That's a second tier. And the third, to me, the most critical need of synagogue life, and it continues in the 21st century, is how do we connect each other beyond the few people we know in the community? How do we expand our tent? How do we make sure that everyone knew or veteran member of the congregation feels that there will be a group of people in the congregation who care for you and will be there for you in good times and in bad. And especially in Southern California where many of us do not live close to extended families, how can these small groups uh, serve that, that need to connect us more deeply uh, with each other. So I applaud you from here to Mina uh, Shemaim, to the heavens for the work you're doing. Well, thank you. And you know, we started these small groups because you pushed me to do so. And then I had just written this book, Increasing Wholeness. And you said, Ellie, this is the text. Yes. And I was unsure if my busy congregants would make the time for conversations. And I was delighted when they did. And it was you pushing me to try it. 
that I have found deeply satisfying. With your work with rabbis and synagogues, what have you, how would you characterize the old synagogue model and what is evolving? Well, the old synagogue model was, frankly, uh, a place uh, that lots of people who were in those synagogue communities had a small group of friends, but we are not evangelical Jews. We are not uh, actually wired, in my view, to be as outreach oriented and in reach oriented as we ought to be. Uh, I, I've learned that the way congregations grow is when they open wide their tent, where they're now virtually and before in person, so that everyone who comes in is immediately engaged in the life of the community. And the, the challenge that I wrote about in Spirituality of Welcoming was first just to warm up our greeting, because in the old model, there were too many stories of people who would walk into a synagogue and no one said hello. And I think we've done a much better job of that since I sort of rang the alarm on that issue. But to go deeper beyond greeting, we need to think clearly about how we use the strategies we know work to deeply engage the people we already have, and to integrate the people we want to welcome in uh, to our spiritual communities. And that begins with hearing people's stories in a way that is much deeper than what most synagogues in the old model used, which were demographic forms. I, I don't learn much about a person on a demographic membership form, but if I sit with you one-on-one -on -one over a cup of coffee, even or a, a Zoom meeting online, or if I meet in a small group on Zoom, and God willing in the near future in person, those are opportunities for us to share our stories, to share experiences, to share our, our journeys through life and deeply connect each other uh, to, to uh, our spiritual community, the synagogue, to Judaism, and uh, certainly to our common goal of spiritual enlightenment. So in that regard, your book, and I called this particular conversation Relational Judaism, what is, if you will, the Chiddush? What for you is the core innovation that you sought to convey? Well, it, it again revolves around thinking through strategies for congregations to link people to each other. So for example, there are 12 principles of engagement in that that I outline in that book that begin with sharing your story. And by the way, there are many ways to share our stories. For example, a lot of congregations now have transformed their Yiscord books from lists of names to the invitation to people to write in short stories about the people they're remembering. Mm. Now that's a good example of how we can deepen our relationships with each other. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and now uh, with the upcoming high holidays, I know many congregations who are using the platform VidHug to create a montage of members wishing each other good yuntif, happy new year, and they'll start their services online by showing this montage of people welcoming each other. And, you know, it's hard on these little screens to do that, but uh, that's another example of ways we can deepen the relationships we already have and open up to uh, new relationships. And then I end the book by really strongly recommending uh, the idea of small groups in building these kinds of relationships. So a follow-up to Relational Judaism, which I published a couple of years ago, is called the Relational Judaism Handbook, which I wrote with two fabulous engagement rabbis, Nicole Arbach at Central Synagogue in New York, 
and Lydia Medwin at the temple in Atlanta, who are rabbis who've been hired by these major synagogues to be almost exclusively small group rabbis. And they now have created in each of their congregations dozens and dozens of small groups of all kinds based on affinity, demography, geography, and availability. And all of that work too, it has broadened this work of relational Judaism. Your effort in building small groups around a community read and discussion is right there in the affinity uh, uh, column because we all want to figure out uh, what kind of wisdom does Judaism have to enhance our lives. So I know that one of the pushes for non-Orthodox synagogues to evolve is Chabad. Yeah. Share the impact of Chabad on American Jewish life, specifically non-Orthodox synagogues. Well, listen, I, I am a, uh, there are a lot of things I don't like about Chabad. Let me start with that. But there are a lot of things I don't like about the megachurch. But what I try to do as an educator is to deduce the principles of what successful groups in the religious communities are doing that we can apply to our own communities. So in the case of Chabad, they also are centered on relationship building. The Chabad rabbi is an expert in getting to know your story, showing up at your events, whether that's a bedside at a hospital or a funeral or a birthday party. And they're also very good at raising their money from you because most good fundraisers will tell you good fundraising is friend raising. And they spend the majority of their time on the phone, in person, bringing shmura matzah and candlesticks and all sorts of things to encourage people to take baby steps into Judaism. So uh, I encourage my rabbi colleagues, I am not a rabbi, but I'm privileged to know many rabbis, to, like you, uh, spend a good portion of their time with a play a playlist out of the Chabad playbook, which is to know your people well. And Rabbi Spitz, I love you, Ellie. I know that your people love you. And that happens because like the Chabad rabbis who are sent to a post for life, they don't move around from synagogue to synagogue. And why? Because the Rebbe knew instinctively that if a rabbi comes to a community and builds it over many decades, you build those kinds of relationships that will sustain the community. And that's exactly what you and Linda have done at CBI. Well, thank you. So COVID, how is COVID from what you've seen? What are, what are, what are the key questions and conversations you're now having with rabbis across the country? Or what have well, you learned? Well, I have to tell you, I was fearful when the pandemic hit that this would be a true threat to our congregations. How could we possibly, in a nanosecond, move all of our worship, all of our programming, all of our small groups, all of our interaction with our congregants on a technology that certainly in the conservative movement, almost nobody was doing. I mean, there are some congregations that were doing live streaming of services to people who are homebound, but nobody had thought of what it was gonna take to move everything online. And I have to tell you, I am so impressed and so absolutely blown away by how effective our congregations have been and our clergy and our educators have been and our executive directors and our staff 
in moving everything online on a dime to keep our congregations vibrant. And here's the, I mean, I have to tell you, Rabbi, I've talked to a lot of your colleagues and they've said, as I'm sure it's true for you, they've never worked so hard in their whole careers. Yeah. So kol kavod to everybody in leadership at the congregation for doing your work. Now, the return on this, this investment, from what I hear from the front lines all over the country has been remarkable. Attendance at worship services is up. It's wow. bigger than people were coming in person. Yeah. Uh, attendance at seminars like this and Torah studies and your wonderful series on the Psalms daily has been remarkable. Yeah. I mentioned Central Synagogue, Rabbi Angela Buckdahl, somebody asked her to do a meditation at noontime. 300 people <laughs> attend that meditation every day. Yeah. And many of them are not members of their synagogue. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be a recruitment tool to that synagogue because yeah. people support what they value. And in this pandemic, when so many people are isolated and feeling lonely and disconnected, the work that you're doing and so many other congregations are doing uh, has been remarkable. And I certainly hope everyone's going to step up to the plate to ensure the financial survivability of our congregations into the future. So the one other topic that I wanted to um, have you address, because in part the timing of this conversation is to promote our small groups, which again, this year are using your book. Yeah, so wonderful. A word before I go to questions and answers, I see I already have a couple um, of comments. So I'll have one first, a comment from Ed Heyman, who again, this event is dedicated to. I want to extend greetings to both of you from Stuart Matlins, with whom oh. I had a very warm conversation two weeks ago. Well, Stuart is an important person in both of our lives. He's the he's publisher. Wonderful. I, sp I spoke to him yesterday. He's the publisher of this book. That's Jewish correct. Lights and my publisher. He's a wonderful, innovative man. So what prompted you to write this book, The Seven Questions? And if other people could, because I have both a chat and a Q&A, if you would pose some questions on Q&A, that's what I will harvest to bring your voice into the conversation with Ron. So what prompted you to write this book? So for years, I've been fascinated with the stories in our tradition of rabbis who imagined what questions they would be asked when they got to heaven. <laughs> and some of our folks on the, on the call will, will know some of these questions. Uh, but uh, there are a number of rabbis who've always had this very, very vibrant imagination that you're asked questions when you get to heaven. It's not to get into heaven. These are questions designed to have you think about how you lived your life on earth. The questions are not about heaven at all. The questions are about how did you use your God-given gifts, your passions, your talents, your time, your relationships to make of your life one of meaning and purpose, belonging and blessing. So, I've always been fascinated with the questions. And what I wanted to do was take the most well-known of those questions, uh, five of them from Rava in the Talmud, one from the, uh, the uh, modern Orthodox rabbi, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, and one from the Hasidic rabbi known as Rabbi Zusya, and ask the question, present the questions to the reader and to your small groups, and then dig underneath the question and figure out what was motivating the question. What's underneath the question? Were you honest in your business? What's, what's that all about? 
And I use in the book short stories to illustrate what I propose are some of the underlying questions that the rabbis were thinking of and that we ought to be thinking of as we pursue what Jewish tradition calls cheshbon hanefesh. Cheshbon means a bill. You know, you go to a restaurant in Israel and at the end of the meal, you get a cheshbon, a, a check, a bill, or an account. And nefesh, of course, is the word for soul. So a cheshbon hanefesh is the process of thinking about an accounting of your soul, which, by the way, is the major purpose of the High Holidays, <laughs> culminating in Yom Kippur, which is, in fact, a rehearsal of this process of answering the questions we'll be asked in heaven. We wear a right shroud. <laughs> Many people, it's a shroud, the white, the white gown that you wear on the bima. And uh, we do many other things that puts us in a place where we do deep spiritual accounting of our souls and figure out where we might have missed the mark and where we can improve in the year to come. That's the purpose of this book. Now, I see this book was written 10 years ago. Wow. Um, what has surprised you in presenting the book? You know, of the many, many lectures that I've given as a scholar in residence all over the world about relational Judaism, about the art of Jewish living, about Jewish education, the one talk that I give that is the most impactful, the most moving, the most inspiring is a talk about this book, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven because it is a kind of challenge to the reader as you explore the questions together. It's a challenge to think about your own life and how you would answer these very provocative, uh, sometimes surprising questions that you're asked about how you lived your life on earth. And what's really cool about it, as I like to end my talk, we get to know the questions now. <laughs> we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. No surprise. So, so the, the opportunity that you're providing your congregation to uh, share those questions with each other and the stories that illustrate them, and then to stimulate everyone in the groups, the small groups, to share their own stories about how you might have been cheated in business. That, that question is not about really about business. It is and it isn't. It's that what's underneath it is trust and honesty and true facts, not fake news. That's what it's about. So um, I'm so excited that your folks are going to be able to explore this uh, together. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I'll show it one more time. I'll show it again later. This is the opportunity this year for small groups, and uh, you'll be able to sign up through our office. Let us know. I'm going to share now some of the questions that have begun. Um, one from my sister, Livia, who with her husband, Michael, just arrived in Laguna Beach from Phoenix yesterday for a little uh, rest and recreation. She writes, many of our people live in nursing homes or t are technolo technologically challenged. How should synagogues reach out to those people who don't have the capacity to use computer? Yes, I've been asked this question a lot. Uh, thank you, Livia, and welcome to California. Uh, I'm sure the Spitz family is thrilled that you're close by. Um, there's something that uh, many of us have called a telephone or, or a cell phone. So most of the folks in nursing homes uh, or living alone and are not technologically savvy still have a phone, either this kind of phone or a landline. And I think the first thing I would suggest, and many congregations do this, is to make regular phone calls to the people you know are not capable of getting online. 
at, so you can check in with them, uh, make sure they know that you're, they're cared for and, uh, and recognized. The second thing some synagogues are doing is delivering uh, baskets of goodies uh, or even groceries um, to those who are not engaged in the technology. Uh, you know, on Purim, we give out Mishloach Manot, you know, baskets of presents. And many synagogues for the high holidays are thinking of doing something like that. And perhaps at Hanukkah, similarly. Uh, and those little gifts are another way to connect with people uh, who are not online. Uh, and the third way, I have to tell you, in the seven months we've been here at Rochester, at the Mayo Clinic, we've had, we have a Caring Bridge site that's had over 20,000 unique visits. It's Wolf's and Kidney Adventure, if you're interested. Um, 20,000 <laughs> unique visits. And we love the comments from people about our, our posts. And we love the emails, and we love the phone calls. But I want to tell you, the single most important thing we've received during our seven months have been greeting cards in the snail mail with handwritten notes from our friends and family. They're sitting on the credenza in our bedroom here at the Hilton Hotel. And they inspired and lifted our spirits as much as anything we received. So for those people in nursing homes, and homebound that don't have the technology, a handwritten note from your staff, your clergy, your, your board leadership, your small group leaders, to people you know or can't get online would be very, 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 very helpful. And make sure you write a personal note on even the you know, store-bought greeting cards. So Karen uh, Melblum Nishioka, asks, um, when small groups get together, and I'm going to, Karen, with your permission, ex reframe your question a little, in the context of small groups, where the obvious, the, you know, the presenting question is what you're asked in heaven, we live in a very turbulent time. People are dying from the virus, uh, climate change, violence in the streets, to what degree does the current realities enter into those conversations? So one of the questions in, that I explore in the book is about um, how you lived your life emotionally. Tsipita uh, Lishua is one of the questions that Rava asks. Did you hope for the messianic salvation. Uh, there's a thin line between hope and fear. Having just lived through seven months of medical surgeries, examinations, uh, diagnoses and prognoses, even today, I can tell you that when you walk into a doctor's office or when you're sitting in a waiting room in a hospital, I know many of you will relate to this, you vacillate between these two emotional poles, hope and fear. Do you live your life with hope or do you live your life in fear? And we are living in a time when there's a lot of fear and it's justifiable fear. But I think our tradition tells us that we ought to try as hard as we can to live a life filled with hope that things will get better, but not just hope and thinking that things will get better, but to act in every way we can on that hope to make things better, not just for us and our families, uh, whether that's insisting on masks and quarantining and all the things we can do, washing the hands and all the stuff we know we're supposed to do uh, to protect each other 
and our friends and our family, but are we doing everything we can possibly do to raise up that emotion of hope in our lives, even in this turbulent time? It's a wonderful question. It would be a good one for your small groups to explore when you get to that chapter. So our, our time now is 5.53. We'll be just going to, for people who are tuning in, we'll, the goal is to finish by six. So we have about six, seven more minutes. Yeah. Mimi Goldstein, who chairs our, here's a change. We used to have a Parshat Hashavua group on Saturday mornings before services led by congregants. And Mimi Goldstein, who asks the next question, was chair of that. And we had to move our Shabbat morning. We moved to Sunday. And what we found was more people attending by virtue of the convenience of coming to the screen. And I'll add, those talks and conversations get posted and many more people watch after the fact. So Mimi asks, has seven questions been used with younger people, university and even high school students? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, you will find it's an easy read. Uh, there's even a bunch of humor in the book. Uh, and if you, if you will, I could spend a minute telling you my very favorite funny story in the book. That might be a good way to end, Rabbi okay. Spitz. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but. Uh, well, it's about this question of uh, Rabbi Hirsch. Shimson Rafi Hirsch is said to have been on his deathbed. And uh, his students gathered around him and said, Rabbi, is there anything we can do for you? And he said, yes, he was in Germany. And he's, he's said to have said, take me to Switzerland. <laughs> and the students say, take me to Switzerland, take you to Switzerland, you're so ill, Rabbi. How could, why, why do you wanna go to Switzerland? And he said, I want to go to Switzerland because when I reach the Almighty, when I get to heaven, how will I answer the Almighty when I'm asked, did you see my Alps? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a question of, did you take advantage of everything permitted to you while you were alive on this earth, all of God's wonderful creation? And Judaism says, we can do that every day of the year, except one day. That day is Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, as I mentioned earlier, we fast all day, we sit in the synagogue all day, or now we're gonna sit online all day. We wear a white shroud, many of us, we wear sneakers to shul when we were there in person. Uh, I do a few things too, to get myself in the spiritual mood. I don't bathe, shave, or wear cologne. And my wife Susie doesn't mind because I don't, bathe, shave, or wear cologne. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're uh, except then, at the end of the holiday, what do we do? We go to a breakfast, and it'll be interesting this year how we do the breakfast. But the best breakfast in the whole United States of America is my cousins Nancy and Don Greenberg in Omaha, Nebraska. For 35 years, they've had 120 people to their home for this enormously gorgeous breakfast where there's strew, homemade strudel and there's blintzes and there's all that, kugels and stuff. But the big thing in Omaha, Nebraska, is every year for 35 years, Don and Nancy have imported from Barney Greengrass in New York, the Sturgeon King smoked fish. <laughs> big platters of herring and Nova locks and pickled lox. And I'm telling you for landlocked Jews in Omaha, Nebraska, this is something. It's a very coveted invitation. <laughs> So once I was, a few years ago, I was at Barney Greengrass in New York for a meeting with our friends from B'nai Jeshurun. And I go to pay the bill and they're sitting, now deceased, the owner, Mo Greengrass, was sitting at his cash register, looking at a table with full of bills and all sorts of things. He was paying no attention to me, but I wanted to engage him in conversation. So I said to him, Mr. Greengrass, my name's Ron Wolfson, I'm from Los Angeles, but I think you know my cousins. Don and Nancy Greenberg. This man, Mo Greengrass, the owner of the place, his head was down like this. As soon as I said Don and Nancy Greenberg, he slowly, slowly, slowly raised his face. He looked me in the eye and he said, good account. 
9104 Davenport, Omaha, Nebraska, 68114. He knew the address by heart. Wow. Good account. Good account. The goal of Yom Kippur and the goal of your small group conversations about the seven questions you're asked in heaven. Well, thank you. Great way to pull this together, Ron. So again, more time with Ron with his book. And I was talking to Ron before we began to say, we'll look to schedule one more conversation after our small groups have had the opportunity to engage this book and engage friends with sharing with Ron what people have gained from that experience and uh, always to gain your wisdom, Ron, about living life fully. So to you and Susie, may it be a year of health and happy surprises. And may that be true for all of us who've had the privilege to share this time with you. Thank, Thank you. you. And an early Shana Tova Umetuka to all of you. And I adore you, Rabbi Spitz. Oh, the you. best you rabbi in the United States of America. <laughs> Thank you, my dear friend. Thank you. To all, to all thank you. Shana Tova. Shana Tova to you. Thanks.